the Memphis Belle and its crew became a national icon, and they represented the thousands of Army Air Force's airmen who were taking the war to the enemy in Europe. At that time, we had no troops on mainland Europe, and it was really our only way to strike the enemy in their heartland. Problem was, we didn't have fighters that could escort our bombers all the way to the targets deep in Germany. As a result of that, we lost a number of airmen and a number of aircraft. So the fact that the Memphis Bell and its crew finished their tour and were the first to come back to the United States was tremendously significant. What we had to do is we had to break the airplane apart, mostly to transport it, to get it up from Memphis. Then once we got it here, it just made sense to leave it in those pieces. It made it easier to do the structural repairs, get the airplane cleaned up. We're going to become more concentrated on this airplane in the near future. We're hoping to get it done faster than, than initially thought. The, uh, the crew and the aircraft went to over 30 locations on the war bond tour, and everywhere they went, they were greeted by thousands and thousands of people. In fact, some of those people got close to the aircraft and carved their names into the aluminum skinning, which is still on the aircraft here. But there was another important purpose for the war bond tour, and that was to train new crews, and also to let these new crews know they could survive their tour. It's a nose-to-tail restoration, top-to-bottom, complete restoration. The aircraft has been disassembled in every single part. If it needs treatment, it will be treated. Parts that are missing will be replaced. Our research staff has gone through thousands and thousands of entries in the maintenance log, which we're very fortunate to have, to pick up changes that were made to the aircraft during its service life. Uh, for instance, there were changes that were made to the aircraft after it came back to the United States and so those changes need to be taken off. There were changes that were made, in fact, here at, at uh, Patterson Field when the aircraft came from production, from Boeing. It was not ready for combat. It was sent here for combat modifications and then was sent overseas. Very robust airplane. Uh, it was called a flying fortress for a reason. The, these are not paper mache models. These are, are life size. They're still very strong structurally. We completely remove the corrosion. Sometimes that means that we have to remove some of the structure. We don't do that to a point of, of weakening the structure, but at the same time it wouldn't be flight worthy. A fascinating part of the story of the Memphis Bell are the number of myths that have grown up over the years. And in fact, the truth behind these myths is far more fascinating than, than the myths themselves. One of the big myths is that the Memphis Bell flew all 25 missions with exactly the same crew members, all 25, and that's simply not true. For instance, the co-pilot, James Varinas, he flew five missions on the Memphis Bell, and then per standard policy at the time, he was assigned an aircraft himself, another B-17, and he became the aircraft commander, and a green pilot was put in the right seat as the co-pilot. The core crew, it was about five or six of the, of the crewmen, and they flew 20 of their missions on the Memphis Bell, and they flew five of their missions on other B-17s because the Bell was either down for maintenance or repair of combat damage. And conversely, the Memphis Bell flew five of its missions with an entirely different crew. Again, same, same reasons. But what all these myths really come down to is that with the situation of the heavy bomber crews in the campaign at that time, there was no way the authorities were going to find an intact crew that had flown 25 missions together. 
for instance, with moving the co-pilot to another aircraft, why have an experienced co-pilot stay that way and put a green pilot in command of another aircraft? After five missions, the co-pilot was experienced. The, the gentlemen that are redoing the, the radial engines that are on the Memphis Bell actually work radial engines whenever they were active duty in the Air Force. So you have some folks that have some real world experience on those type of engines and such where the younger guys or the, the newer generation just simply don't have that experience. We've got a staff of 23 paid employees, 67 volunteers right now. To work here, you have to have a big toolbox, a lot, a lot of different abilities because we don't have the luxury of having painters, uh, sheet metal guys, uh, systems guys, things like that. We have to, be, have to know a little bit of everything on these aircraft. The completion date for the Memphis Bell has yet to be determined. It'll be determined by what the restoration crew finds and what work needs to be done. We're still looking at uh, some years yet before the aircraft will be completely restored. To me, I, I take a, a lot of pride in being able to honor what I do consider our greatest generation, the World War II generation. Uh, the maintainers, the, the guys that flew them, uh, I, I just think it's awesome that we're able to preserve this significant piece of history for generations to come. There's enormous meaning for the aircraft to be here. It is recognized, its name is recognized, it allows our visitors including those that come to our website, not just the visitors that come here. It's a springboard for them to get a better understanding of the service and sacrifice of thousands and thousands of our airmen and, in fact, all of our servicemen during World War II. It is not important just in and of itself and its crew's history, but really it's important because it represents all of our thousands of airmen who served and sacrificed during the war.